Can you tell early on if you're going to be a baseball star? Join me as I now interview Lance Parrish. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Uncommon Sense. We have a thrilling program for you today as I interview Lance Parrish, our coach of the Great Lake Loons, mm -hmm. uh, an important position. I am the first to learn about baseball, and so it's a rare opportunity for me to have him here. He has a stellar career as a Californian, and he was the 16th pick in 1974 by the Detroit Tigers. He was there 19 years. Yeah and uh, was six times part of the Tigers all-star team and eight times part of the league's all-star team and three times a Golden Glove and four times a Silver Slugger and oh my goodness ten years as a coach mm -hmm. and he's been a coach in the bench in uh, third base and hitting and I'm missing one <laughs> but anyway I understand the catcher gives the signals to the pitcher and this is like really important because it's a mind game baseball between the pitcher and the batter. What preparation, how do you train yourself to be a really good catcher since this is the pivotal position on the team? Well I'll be honest with you, it, uh, it's just through trial and error and, and uh, uh, catching an awful lot of games and working with an awful lot of pitchers and a lot of uh, coaching staffs. and just trying to figure out the right formula as to what really works during, uh, during any given game. You know, you never have any game identical to the last or the, you know, they're all different. They're all different. And every pitcher that you work with in any given game is going to throw a different type of a ball game. It's a constant game of adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever pitch you call, you're trying to outguess the hitter or, or the pitcher's trying to throw a pitch that uh, he might uh, feel that is his strength at that mm -hmm. particular time or might be throwing a pitch that's directed at that hitter's weakness at that given time so you know there's a lot of thought process that goes into it sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work <laughs> but um, like you, life. you're always trying that's exactly right um, do you watch tapes of, uh, of a, an opposing hitter game so you sort of get what they're good at or how they move you know you know, we, we do have tapes, and actually, yeah. uh, a few years ago, when I was still with the, the Tigers coaching staff, they have a, uh, a scouting group. It's a national scouting group now that uh, all they do is watch games on television. No and kidding. They, and they scout each individual player, and they chart everything that they do, whether they're a hitter, whether they're a pitcher. They, they scout their tendencies. They chart their tendencies. Hmm. So whenever we would go into, let's say, for example, we were going into Minnesota to play the Twins, right. um, there would be a box waiting for us of, and everybody got a notebook and it had uh, every player on the team and probably for their last 50 at bats what their tendencies were during those last 50 at bats. The pitches that they hit uh, in little quadrants in the strike zone, huh. what they hit for averages in those quadrants, the pitches that they were had more of a tendency to swing at and miss, the pitches that they had trouble hitting, whether it be an off-speed pitch or a, a fastball, up, down, inside, outside. So they really leave nothing to chance anymore. They don't quite get that elaborate in the minor leagues, but right. at the major league level, they've got all that available to them now. And it's just a, a period where you just go over and over and over and over, guys. As a catcher, I think the best weapon that you have is just to pay attention to the guys that are up at the plate. If you face a team more than once, uh, usually you can see in the first couple, three at-bats that they have what they're really trying to do as a hitter. You know, I always try to tell my catchers now, if, uh, if a batter's diving at the ball, uh, you know, you're probably going to be able to get inside on him. If he's pulling off the ball, then you're probably going to be able to get him out throwing pitches away from him. If they sit back, if they lean forward, if they lean back, you know, those are all the little intricacies you have to watch when you're watching a hitter as to how you call a game as a catcher. And then 
up and above all that, you have to be able to know your pitcher's strengths and weaknesses and what they're yeah. capable of doing. So it kind of all works hand in hand, and it's kind of a complicated process. But after a while, it gets a little bit easier. Does a hitter change his intention during the time he's up? For example, Absolutely. if the strike does he changes his feet or changes his idea of what he wants to do? Uh, you know, they do. Most of the time, uh, early in the count, before a hitter gets two strikes, he will just try to in most cases, yeah. uh, take his normal approach to the ball. Try to drive the ball wherever it's at. Usually when they get two strikes on them, they try to uh, probably open their stance a little bit more to have more of a, a solid base mm -hmm. um, so that they can protect themselves from shifting their weight as much as they probably, they really wouldn't want to shift their weight. It's easier to keep your weight back and keep balance when you've got a wider base. So mm -hmm. because they're trying to protect against breaking balls and fastballs and all that, uh, you know, the first two swings, as they say, are usually the hitters. And then after that, once you get two strikes, you try to widen your base and you just try to protect. You just try to hit the ball wherever it's pitched, whatever the pitcher throws you. Uh, a lot of guys will practice that, some guys not so much. But uh, that's generally what they try to do. Baseball is sort of an intellectual game in a sense, isn't it? I well, more like so chess, than people but, would think, yeah. But you know, maybe more than the other, because you're well, sort of interacting, like you said. You know, it's a, it's a cat and mouse game between managers. It's a cat and mouse game between pitchers and catchers and the hitters and vice versa. And You know, you're always trying to be one step ahead of the, the opponent, and they're trying to do the same thing with you. That's why they have all these signs that they put on and uh, uh, try to put different plays on, uh, hit and runs, bunt plays, squeeze plays, uh, different things like that. You always try to, try to gain an edge and advantage somehow. And... Uh, Usually the manager, because you know a lot of things that we do anymore are really no secret to anybody. It's just exactly when you're going to do them. So you know a good manager will try to st stay a step ahead of what's really going on in the game and try. How to, does he do that? Well, uh, just through years of experience. Uh huh. Through years what's of experience. What's he looking for? Uh, situations, tendencies, uh -huh. and situations. Uh, usually late in the game, if uh, say for example, if we were down by a run, yeah, uh, late in the game, and we got our, our first hitter up to the plate. Uh, and he got on base. Well, the opposition would assume in that situation that you're going to try to bunt him over to second base to try to get him in scoring position. And that's generally what everybody does. Sometimes he might, uh, you know, because he, he knows that you're thinking on along the same lines that he's thinking, might try to hit and run right there or might try to just have the guy steal or might do a, a, you know, a few different things and not just go with the conventional, you know, sacrifice bunt. But generally that's the way the game's played. They use hand signals. How often do they change what those hand signals mean? All the time. Like All the within time. the game? Well, Every other sometimes. Game? Oh, you really? know, sometimes if, uh, you know, sometimes you might see, for example, a catcher behind the plate giving signs to the pitcher. Now, generally, when there's a man on second base or there's a man on base, um, you know, the, the signs will be different. If there's a guy on first base, you'll have one set of signs to the pitcher. If there's a man on second base, you try to change them up so that the runner on second can't pick them up. I see uh, what you're they'll saying. give indicators and all that and change things around. And every now and then, the uh, catcher might see this, the runner that's on second base may be doing something that he feels might be tipping his pitches off or location. So he'll go out to the mound and tell the pitcher, okay, we're switching over to this or that. And then it's, you know. Are there several sets of. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How many there's, sets? What would well, the range be? For any given team, I would say there's probably three or four different sets oh, of signs. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Do you find coaching different, or what would be the differences coaching a major league team versus a low A? Egos. Egos? Tell me about <laughs> that. Egos. Uh, you know, well, the, the guys that are in the major leagues are the guys that have already made it. They've, uh -huh. already, uh, they've already reached the top of their game, so to speak. Uh, you never really stop learning in the game, but uh, they've achieved their goal to get to the major league level. Uh, in most cases, they make a lot of money, and in most cases, they think they know more than you know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a, gosh, there's a uh, little bit of a psychologist's mentality involved when you become a coach because you have to be able to get along with your players. You have to be able to lead your players. You have to be able to get them to follow the uh, ideas and the leads that you have for them to follow and sometimes... How do you do that? Well, you just have but what to... what do you have you to... You have to gain their trust and you have to earn their trust. By doing what? Uh, 
just by being consistent with them and, and uh, you know, I, I guess as a manager you have to lay the law down and stick with it and you can't back down because if you back down with one guy, everybody else is watching that and they figure if one guy can get to you, then there's no reason why I couldn't get to you or everybody else on the team couldn't get to you. That's why I think a guy like Jim Leland has some, done such a great job throughout his career and also with the Tigers the last couple of years because he's known as a no-nonsense guy. He lays the law down, that's, that's the law. He doesn't vary from that. And he doesn't, it doesn't matter to him if you make you know, the minimum salary in baseball or you're making 15 or $20 million. The one thing that he has always said all along, because I had the opportunity to play for him, is that you have one privilege in baseball, and that comes on the 1st and 15th of every month. <laughs> Everybody gets their paychecks on the 1st and the 15th, and beyond that, you're no different than anybody else. So he tries to treat everybody equally. He tries to discipline everybody equally. Everybody's on the, the same People team. People appreciate that. Oh, I think they do. I really do. When you were, were young, what drew you to baseball? I just loved to compete. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I played baseball, football, basketball whenever I had the opportunity, but I think my true love was baseball. And, uh, you know, at a young age, having a chance to uh, either play in the neighborhood with uh, some of the guys in the neighborhood or down at the schoolyard or eventually when I got into organized baseball I I just uh, I was pretty good at it and I enjoyed the competition and it was just uh, a lot of fun for me to do so I, I stayed with it and and you know each level that I moved up I continued to have a little bit of success so you know I was fortunate when uh, high school rolled around and at the end of my high school uh, years uh, Detroit Tigers came knocking and wanted to draft me so to me I had an opportunity to go f uh, to UCLA to play football I had a scholarship oh. offer there so I was going to play football and baseball at UCLA out in California, or I could just sign with the Tigers and get paid to play. So it yeah. <laughs> really wasn't that difficult a decision for me. Did you have a great, did you have an early recognition that you had this talent or that you build up the talent? How does that work? You know, I don't think you really ever know how good you are at, uh -huh. at any given time. I mean, I, uh, I just loved to play, and, and I, was, I was pretty good. I mean, I, I did some things that... Uh, you know, after a while, it was like, you know, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And I had people come up to me and say, you know, you, you know, you, you've got some talent in this area, or you could do these things well. And uh, I don't know if you really, actually, I, I should say, I, I didn't know at any given time if I was ever good enough to play in the major leagues. Mm. Um, I was just enjoyed playing at every level that I went to. I had guys, some of the coaches that were in the uh, high schools that I, we played against that told me that I was going to get drafted, that I was oh. going to get drafted in the first round, that I should ask for this much money when I get drafted. Well, that was so far beyond my thinking at the time. It was just like I just was enjoying what I was doing then. And uh, eventually when the Tigers did draft me, uh, you know, I, I kind of took it a step at a time. It was like I was just thankful to have the opportunity to play professional baseball. What a great attitude. And then uh, my thought was never really I would be uh, – I guess I would be crushed if I never made it to the major leagues. I was just happy to be playing professional baseball. And after my first couple of years in minor league ball, I found out that it wasn't as easy as it had been throughout my career up to that point. I wasn't so sure I was actually going to make it or not. But when I did make it and got a chance to play in the major leagues, it was, uh, it was awesome. I was, it was very Are there rewarding. people who recognize from the beginning or are, are seen to have an extraordinary talent or is it more you grow into it as you did? Well, I think uh, there comes a point in time when you honestly recognize that you uh, are pretty good athletically. Yeah. But, you know, I've seen a lot of great athletes come through baseball and never make it to the major leagues. Uh -huh. You know, there's, uh, there's a little intangible involved there. That's, oh, what uh, is that? It's consistency. You know, and, and like I say, uh, been a lot of number one draft picks that uh, have come and gone and never had an opportunity to play at the major league level. And, you know, the game's not as easy as people think. And uh, where you might have been successful in college or high school, it's not always as easy in professional baseball. There's even been guys that have been, you know, successful all the way up the ladder, all the way through uh, professional baseball as far as they get to the, you know, the major leagues. They might have had great minor league careers and put up fantastic numbers. But every time they get a chance at the major league level, they just can't seem to, to raise their it. game to that level. So, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's very difficult. And you don't only have to do it once in a while. You have to be very consistent to make a career out of it, and that's not too easy. What, what did you have to learn in, in terms of getting along with your colleagues on the team when you talk about big egos? 
You know, I try to treat everybody the way that I would uh, appreciate being treated. You know, whether I'm a player, a player on player, a coach on player, manager on player, I know as a player there was a certain type of individual, a certain type of coach or manager that I appreciated, and I appreciated the way that they treated me. Uh, obviously, I had an opportunity to play for guys like Sparky Anderson and Jim Leland and a few others, and I appreciated the way that they treated me um, as a player. Uh, they didn't try to lord over me the fact that they were the manager of the team and you know, tried to, to pound that down my throat. They treated me as, a, as an equal. Obviously, they had authority over me, right. but they tried to but treat me as they had respect for you. Absolutely, and they did respect me, and I respected them for respecting me. Yeah. You know, Once you cross that line and you lose that respect, then you're in a whole different arena. But uh, I try to treat my players with respect. I try to treat them the way that I enjoyed being treated. And, you know, I think it's reciprocated. So I, I believe that they are men and they appreciate that and they, they like to be respected that way. As a coach, since you coached various of the positions, or what, what did you learn from each of those that served you well as now being an overall coach, coaching a manager? Coaching different coaching yeah, positions? Third, yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. When I, uh, when I got out of baseball as a player, I always thought I could pretty much do anything. You know, and you made reference to me being a catcher. Catchers are involved in a lot of what goes on throughout the course of the game. So I felt uh, there wasn't really anything that I couldn't, uh, couldn't do. Uh, Loving you know, the confidence. When I got into uh, coaching, I found out it was a little bit different. Uh, I didn't really know as much as I thought I knew. But uh, my, uh, my opportunities that I've had when I first got out of playing, I, I was a coach at the minor league level. I was a manager at the minor league level. Then I went to the big leagues with Detroit and coached in the bullpen and on third base. I was on the bench. I uh, was even a manager for a couple days when uh, Larry Parrish was suspended for a couple days in 99. So, uh, you know, once all that was done, then I got a chance to come back here and be a, a manager again. It's just all of everything combined. I tried to pay attention to everything everybody's ever talked to me about and how they do certain things. and. I can't say that I'm a genius at any one thing, but I've picked up a lot of things along the way, and I feel like I uh, have a pretty good understanding of the way you're supposed to approach hitting, the way you're supposed to play defense, the way you're supposed to you know, do a lot of things in the game. And, and the fun part about that is that I feel like it's, it's a great opportunity for me to give a little bit back and pass along what I've learned throughout the course of my career to these guys that are trying to... Uh, to realize their dream and making it to the major leagues. So if I can help any of these guys and uh, you know have a little bit of fun and su success along the way, then then I've achieved my goal. You know, when uh, we re revere sports so much in America, and if you have some success, you get a level of fame. How did how did that impact your life? You know, I've uh, I've never really I guess I've never really felt comfortable with the fame part of it. Yeah. Uh, I don't. Uh, I'm not somebody that really, you know, just thrives in the limelight. Mm -hmm. I, I, I enjoy, I, I guess, the appreciation that people have for the way that I've uh, played throughout my career. I, I've always been treated exceptionally well in Michigan. Uh, everybody's always been very gracious to me every time I come back here in whatever capacity, uh, first as a player and then as an opposing player and then as a coach. and. Uh, you know, they've always been great. They've always treated me really well, and I, and I do. Um, my wife and I both, our whole family, re really appreciate that. But, um, you know, it's, uh, the fame part of it, it's, it comes and it goes. You know, I, I would rather be treated just like, you know, your everyday guy. Uh, I, I, like I say, I, I appreciate the fact that people still remember my career. I remember some of the things that I did, was a part of the world championship team. But beyond that, I don't, uh, I don't seek anything beyond that. It's, it's just nice that people come up to you and recognize you and say hi and, you know, love the way what's you the, played. What's the role, Arlen, your wife and I, and you were talking beforehand, and I was asking about moving around and how does that impact family life. Right. And, but what is the role of a wife of a baseball player? I mean, those are intense periods of training and, and then playing, and then I guess there's a quiet time. What? Does, a, does a, a, a woman married to a baseball player have a, a role in his life other oh, than the personal? Absolutely. My wife is, uh, she's the president of the company, more or less, uh, for lack of a better term. She, she does everything. She is everything. She has to keep uh, everything together. 
uh, I can't give her enough credit for all the sacrifices she's had to make and all the things she's had to do throughout our entire marriage uh, with the kids with the moving with the you know she could come in here and tell you a thousand stories about having to haul the kids across the country and climb on an airplane with three little kids and toting bags and uh, trying to keep them all quiet and doing the luggage and you know when I'm gone uh, when I was playing and had to be gone all the time and you know she has to run the entire house she's mom and dad she's the cook she's the housekeeper she's the everything and and I just kinda come and go and and uh, tried to do the best job we could as a team to try to keep everybody uh, focused and uh, really a part of the family we tried to do things during the offseason together as a family mm -hmm. but you know during the season especially when the 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 kids got a little bit older and they wanted to stay in one place and they wanted yeah. to be with their friends and they didn't want to move around all the time. It became especially difficult for um, us as a family. You know, Arlene and I had a difficult time, uh, you know, trying to, to find time to get together, to, yes. uh, to find windows in the schedule to, to bring everybody, you know, either to a city that we were traveling to or for them to come out to where I was at. You know, we we had our home base in California so when the kids were all in high school and uh, you know we'd look forward to uh, the school season being over and then I have to find out that one of the kids had to go to summer school so that kind of yeah. shot down all the plans uh, so you it was just a constant adjustment period for everybody but I will say that my wife did an awesome job yeah, our kids are like our that. kids are incredible uh, and uh, we tried to just ham and egg it and do the best job that we could if uh, one wanted to become a coach in baseball, what are the avenues one, one could do besides being a player for a major league team? How do you prepare for that kind of a Well, you know, a lot, of your, a lot of your coaches are not, uh, or actually have not been in the major leagues. A lot of your coaches are guys that never got out of the minor leagues, but they love the game and they want to stay in the game. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, high school and college coaches that never got into professional baseball. They just love the game and they've either got involved at a uh, little league level or uh, uh, a little higher level than that or maybe even just jumped into it uh, in high school. I al I've always, you know, in reading the sports pages over and over, there are always opportunities for guys um, wow. that high schools will advertise, let's say in the newspaper, that they're looking for a uh, a manager at a certain school they're looking for a uh, or I should say a head coach at a certain school or or a coach or, or whatever there's there's always opportunities um, you know you just if you love the game you get in the game and, and so you can really transit between you know, a high school coach and a low well, age sure you can I mean there's no guarantees I mean yeah. you obviously you have to have a little bit of luck in there and it's kind of who you know sometimes but you know there's always opportunities for guys to bounce around and move up the ladder and you know, everybody takes different avenues. You would think a manager would have to go through a certain process at the major league level to become a manager. But there have been guys that have come right out of the radio booth or right out of the TV booth that have never had a day's experience managing whatsoever, but yet they've been chosen to become the manager of a major league team. So that in itself doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you actually look at uh, the criteria involved, but, but it happens. When you divide your year, like for example, how long will you be in Midland? When do you arrive here and when would you be thinking of leaving? Well, you know, we, uh, we start our spring training regimen uh, at the end of February. Uh -huh. And then we, we go through spring training for a month and then we come here at the beginning of April. Okay. Okay. So the entire, the entire month of March we're in Florida for spring training, which will be Arizona in a couple of years because yeah. we're moving to Arizona. But... Uh, we get, to, I think we all got to uh, Midland, uh, I would say around the 3rd of April, mm -hmm. and we will be here until probably the 3rd of September, unless we make the playoffs, and then it'll be extended. And did the Dodgers pick you? How, how did you get your position? Well, actually, uh, well, they did pick me, but yeah. I, I made a few phone calls to see <laughs> if there was any availability. I mean, that's, that's how it works. I mean, right. I... I I've been in baseball, I've had coaching experience, but the only way that I'm going to get a job is to, you know, put some feelers out there and see if an organization needs a coach or needs a manager and, and you know, a lot of times there's openings at different levels in the minor And did they pick the team or do you have any say in that? Uh, they pretty much picked the team. 
Yeah. You know, uh, this particular year, um, we have a new farm director. We have a new field coordinator. Um, I think uh, he's, he's chosen to do things a little bit differently than the, the guy that we had in the past, Terry Collins, who is a local guy from uh, this area. But uh, he went on to manage a team in Japan, which I'm really interested to see how that's working out. But uh, our farm director um, just with, at the end of spring training handed me a sheet of paper and said, here's your team. Oh, you know, I love that. These are the that. guys that you want. So, <laughs> You know, I was all prepared to put on a battle for some some guys that I wanted, but it was like, here you go. So, just take what you can. Recognize get. talent, huh? Yeah, absolutely. We've learned a great deal today, and I want to point out a couple of things. One is to recognize um, in yourself how competitive you are, and if you are, to enjoy it, and also to enjoy the moment wherever you are. Live that experience fully. He did in his baseball, as he and, and other sports, as he moved around. Take advantage of opportunities. He learned early on to treat people fairly and consistently. He learned it from his coaches, but I'm sure you live that way now. Now that you are the manager, and the, the, of course, as a woman, I will appreciate this. But I think he's quite wise when he calls his wife the president of the company because. She has a lot of responsibility for making the kind of world that makes it easy for him to come in and out of and to celebrate what he can contribute when he's there or on the phone. There are other great things that I, I admire about him and that he's quite in his own way entrepreneurial. He reaches out for what he thinks would be an interesting time or an interesting thing to do. And I think that's something we could all include in our lives. And I think also he was really to denominate his life around his children. He mentioned one had to do summer school, so they scratched the plans. It's good to be a good father. So we want to thank him for being with us today. And I want to remind you, as always, kindness counts. Please go out today and do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know. And repeat it again tomorrow and the next day. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Mr. Lance. Right. <laughs> Have a good time. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadone.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadone.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan.